Good happy Sunday morning, July 4th, 2021. Happy 4th of July, everyone, and welcome to this Sunday morning edition of the Riley King Newscast, right here on the Riley King Network. We have a lot of news to get to this Sunday morning, so let's get started right now. First step. First Lady Jill Biden visits New Hampshire. Let's take a listen to that video from WNUR News 9. Whether you're planning a weekend in New Hampshire's majestic White Mountains, a hike up in Adnock, or a week-long stay in our picturesque coast, road tripping wants you to know... This evening's event here at Senator Jean Shaheen daughter Stephanie's home, a real celebration. Stephanie changing her annual 4th of July plans to welcome the First Lady and celebrate freedom from COVID. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden receiving a warm welcome from the crowd in Portsmouth. The intimate gathering, a good place to showcase America back together. The theme of the First Lady's tour. People smiling, sharing laughs, and even hugs with Dr. Biden. A dramatic difference from just last year. Who would have thought that we would be here on the 4th of July together again. Using what she called her teacher voice, Dr. Biden spoke of the successes New Hampshire has seen in efforts to vaccinate people, not forgetting where we came from as we celebrate our newfound freedoms this 4th of July. Think of where our heads were. Think about how we felt. Think about washing our groceries and Think about the grocery aisles and how empty they work. And now, people mingling without masks. The day's event hosted by Senators Hassan and Shaheen. Senator Shaheen says she's happy to show the First Lady gratitude from the Granite State. People in the neighborhood are very excited to have her here to talk about the work that they're doing in the White House to end the pandemic to get people back to work and to make sure people have access to health care. And Senator Hassan also calling it time to be proud to call New Hampshire home. It's truly New Hampshire indeed. And again, it's about celebrating what makes us strong. Dr. Biden spending about an hour here speaking with guests and posing for photos, something neighbors here won't soon forget. In Portsmouth, I'm Nicole Lally, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Eleven arrested as standoff involving group of armed men on I-95 in Massachusetts comes to an end. Let's take a listen to that video from WCVB Boston. At New England Dental Group, we use the latest innovations to provide affordable dental implants, specializing in the all-on-4 solution for a completely new smile. Call today about your dental implants. New England Dental Group, all your dental experts at one location. Nobody was hurt. In fact, no shots were fired, but the men insisted they did nothing wrong, and for nearly nine hours, they refused to give up. State police shut down about a two-mile section of I-95 in and around Wakefield while they negotiated with a group of armed men and while the men streamed the standoff on social media. We are on the Interstate 95 near uh, exit 57.4. State police say one of their troopers had come across the men in the middle of the night, pulled over along the highway in two vehicles, putting fuel in one of their tanks. The men were wearing tactical-style gear and carrying rifles and pistols and told the trooper they were headed from Rhode Island to Maine for what they called training. Our vehicle is full of camping equipment, which supports uh, what I said about how we're going to our private land to train. The trooper asked for IDs and firearms licenses. The men said they didn't have any, so the trooper called for backup. Eleven armed individuals standing uh, with long guns slung on an interstate highway uh, at two in the morning certainly raises concerns. As more police arrived, some of the men scattered into woods. Two were taken into custody about a mile away. Eventually, all 11 men surrendered without incident. Three asked to go to the hospital for pre-existing medical conditions. People should feel confident right now that we have 11 people in custody. We have taken custody of a number of firearms 
and we are continuing the investigation. Now, at this point, state police say the men are refusing to give them identifications so that they're not in a position at this point to release their names. They're likely to remain locked up until a court hearing on Tuesday, at which point they will face charges, including transporting a firearm, a loaded firearm, on a state highway. Live in Stoneham, David Beanick, WCVB News Center 5. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Big crowds expected across Maine this weekend as 4th of July celebrations return. Let's take a listen to that video from WMTW News 8 Maine. Wasn't feeling well, so I headed for the ER, and as soon as I walk in, I coded. I thought we lost him. Luckily, when they put him on the ECMO, they were able to get him to the cath lab and unblock his heart. ECMO is a portable pump that replaces the function of the heart or lungs. These patients, if it were not for the ECMO program, have very low probability of survival. It's amazing. It's just mm, incredible. Brought to you by Maine Health. American flags are flying, and the Songo River Queen is able to roll at full capacity again after being limited during the pandemic. People visiting the local eateries, albeit under the tarps on this rainy Friday, and they're looking for a glimmer of clear skies for the all-important fireworks show Sunday night. I think a lot of people are excited, like they haven't been able to get out and do anything for so long, and, and now they get an opportunity to come out and enjoy the parade and, and see the fireworks. The town is ready to party again, a 4th of July weekend like the old days, before COVID. It's nice to see faces, complete faces, no masks. It's nice. Harry Hughes is the owner of Sun Sports, along the causeway for nearly 30 years. The 4th of July is always a huge weekend for retail on the causeway, whether you're a, you know, a restaurateur or a retailer. Um, there's a lot of people in town, um, whether they're camping or they're coming up to their second home. It's it's it's. The, I'd say the busiest weekend of the summer. The 4th of July parade returns this year, Sunday at 2, live music on the town greens at 6, and the fireworks at 9.30. All that was canceled in 2020 is coming back in 2021. It was pretty busy last year with nothing going on. I imagine it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be packed. There'll be a lot of people out here. Now, here's uh, what you need to know. If you plan to come here or pass through here, a section of Route 302, which is the causeway, will be closed for about a half hour, uh, a little bit before the fireworks at 9.30, a little bit after. So plan ahead, get here early, park, and enjoy. We're live in uh, Naples tonight. Jim Keefley, WMTW News 8. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Fourth of July, where to see fireworks in Vermont and New York. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC5. It's a new season. Make it your best with a new Tempur-Pedic mattress from Ashley Home Store. Tempur Down to the last few weeks of planning, North Country Fourth of July celebrations are happening this year. NBC5's Elena Barilla takes us to Rouse's Point and Plattsburgh and tells us more about their plans for Independence Day. 60 years of 4th of July festivities in Rouse's Point. It was supposed to be last year. 
so we are doing a redo. The big anniversary was given a traffic parade last year instead. And that's what we wanted to do during the pandemic, was just to have that community feel again. But now a bigger, more vibrant celebration is in order. The volunteer committee getting a month for planning instead of a whole year after waiting for health guidance from the state. All of a sudden it was a go. I think we were sort of in shock. <laughs> Honestly, we're like, wow, this is really happening. Oh my gosh, we gotta get going. The Stars and Stripes on the Lake celebration is coming together with great support from the American Legion. A carnival, live music, a parade and fireworks, all in the plan through thousands of dollars in donations to bring the event back to life and the community back together. I think we just miss that so much, just in general. And I think this year is gonna be even bigger to have that involvement with the community and the people around us. Plattsburgh's 4th of July parade is coming back after last year's curbside celebration. You can register for the lineup through the city's website or Facebook page by June 28th. Just asking for the community to, to kind of do their part and do their due diligence. Those who aren't fully vaccinated should wear face coverings and social distance. Continuing to, to promote how we're going to be doing this safely and, um, you know, making sure that, that we're, we're adhering to those guidelines. They'll have fireworks too, and the theme is interstellar, all things space. We're just really excited for, for the community to get to come back together in, in a safe way. In Plattsburgh, Elena Barilla, NBC5 News. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Fourth of July returns to Enfield. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC Connecticut News. Liners, repairs, or caps, call Spotless Chimney. You're trusted, locally owned and operated, certified professionals. You know, this was not your typical 4th of July weekend, right? But a lot of people were not complaining, especially after last year's holiday was so different because of the pandemic. This year, it's the weather that seemed to cause those last-minute changes. NBC Connecticut's Matt Austin found, while many fireworks shows were postponed, at least in Enfield, the show went on. A night two years in the making. As the Enfield 4th of July town celebration fireworks returned. What are you excited for? Just the fireworks. It's nice that they're starting to get back to somewhat normal happenings in town. Many were disappointed after the celebration was canceled last year because of the pandemic. We're so excited to be back. Izzy Post says normally this is a big event attracting around 60,000 people and filled with lots of activities. This year was scaled back to the fireworks and a parade following concerns about fundraising and potential COVID rules. We were like, what is the bare minimum that we could do to still give the community um, something to look forward to for the 4th of July? But then another challenge, the weather. Organizers met this morning to study the forecast for later in the day. Made the call that we felt uh, that we were trusting in our forecasters that uh, the, the weather primarily was going to be moving more east than over Rhode Island. So fireworks were loaded, though the racks had to be moved since the original location was too wet. And with some light rain falling, people started gathering tonight. I got snacks, I've got umbrella, the chair. I'm very surprised that they were going to do this even though it was raining tonight. It's but there's not pouring now, so I think it's great that they're still going on with the show. And soon after, the skies lit up with a dazzling display. <laughs> Through so many challenges, a sign of perseverance and things starting to return back to normal. It's so important. People want to get out. They want to do something. Around the state, more shows are planned on Sunday and throughout the month of July. To find one close to you, just click on the NBC Connecticut app. In Enfield, Matt Austin, NBC, Connecticut News. Okay, and there you go on the New England. that video and that report.
Who is the armed group involved in the I-95 standoff in Massachusetts? Let's take a listen to that video from WPRI Providence News. And the checkpoints we do during that process to ensure a good quality installation when the customer is done, they're happy with everything that we do. My name is on every truck. It's Briggs Mechanical. We're looping in 12 News reporter Matt Paddock. He has more, you know, about this group and their Rhode Island connection. Matt, what do you know? That's right, Chelsea. According to the group's website, the rise of the Moore's mission is to, quote, educate new Moors and influence their elders. And as 12 News law enforcement analyst Stephen O'Donnell says, this group has been on local law enforcement's radar since the 90s. According to our law enforcement analyst, Stephen O'Donnell, the Rise of the Moors is a group who says their ancestors came from Morocco, and members believe they don't have to answer to American law. They don't believe they have to pay taxes, listen to the courts, listen to the government, listen to any laws, and um, that's certainly not the case. And obviously they found out that wasn't accurate. O'Donnell credits Massachusetts State Police for how they handled the situation with the armed men. He says this could have been a very different story. The history with these type of, and I would call them sovereign citizens groups, they've turned lethal for law enforcement in different places around the country. This luckily didn't turn that way. O'Donnell says this incident isn't unusual especially after a major economic event like the pandemic. There's been major issues with the economy, or this is the best example of major issues. We just, just had a pandemic, so the economy turned pretty sour. There's some angry people, and that always spurs some anti-government rhetoric and things like that. And he warns that groups like the Rise of the Moors poses a threat to organizations looking to be recognized. There's a whole indigenous movement out of Rhode Island and other states to be recognized by our government, but they're doing it through a process. They're legally trying to find data, have lawyers, and they're working with the state and federal governments to figure out how they go about living within the rules of this country. We asked O'Donnell about what charges these 11 people could be facing. He says New England state laws have stiffer gun laws, especially if there are any previous felony charges. If you're looking at 10 years in, in federal prison, it's called a felony possession of a firearm. Um, if they're not Felons, they, they might be breaking some other law about carrying a weapon to and from. Um, some weapons are supposed to be disengaged. Um, they can't be, the ammunition can't be with the firearm. All 11 males arrested today in Wakefield refer to themselves as a militia in state that they adhere to Moorish sovereign, sovereign ideology. Those suspects are due in court on Tuesday. And reporting in studio, Matt Paddock, 12 News. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. FAU Professor Civil engineer weighs in on plans to demolish the rest of the Champlain Towers South. Let's take a listen to that video from WPBS 25 News, Florida. With my new TD Double Up credit card, I really get double cash back. You do? You guys, like, love me. Gianna, and that civil engineer is also a professor at Florida Atlantic University. He says he agrees with the state's decision to bring Champlain Towers south, the remaining portion of the building, down before any impacts of the storm can be felt in South Florida. Earlier today, Miami Mayor, Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cava shared her thoughts about this new decision from the state. It is all of our fervent desire that this can be done safely before the storm so that we can direct the demolition. And this demolition would be one that would protect and preserve evidence and allow the maximum search and rescue activity to continue. Now, the plan originally was to take the tower down in the coming weeks, but state and Miami-Dade County leaders say the approaching storm forced them to explore other options. That's when they contracted the Maryland-based company Controlled Demolition Incorporated 
to look at taking the building down as soon as possible. Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue says while the demolition plans are still being finalized, the county mayor says teams will do their best to make sure the demolition does not impact the adjacent debris mound that crews are searching through for survivors. The FAU professor we spoke with today says since the rescue effort had to be halted for 15 plus hours on Thursday due to concrete movement in the building and the storm is on its way, he thinks this decision is the best approach. I think we don't want to go have any more people put at risk. And if we can collapse the building in a controlled manner, we can remove the debris and the guys can get back to work trying to, uh, you know, go through and, and, and recover what they can. And, and, and in case there's somebody that's still there, that's still alive, we can get them out. Now, an exact time of the demolition has not been announced, but county leaders say that once the plans are finalized, the company will only need about 36 hours to ultimately bring that building down. Now, right now, officials do not believe any other nearby structures are going to have to be evacuated as a result of the demolition. Gianna, back to you. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. And that does it for this Sunday morning edition of the Riley King Newscast right here on the Riley King Network. Thank you for joining us for this Sunday morning edition. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and see you back here later on today for another newscast. I'll have a newsy report coming up in a little bit. Goodbye, everyone.